Hello and welcome to Doc Talk Live. This is North Bay Healthcare's way of reaching out to the community on important health information. Today we're talking about when it's more than just heartburn. And our guest speaker here is North Bay Healthcare interventional gastroenterologist Nazia Hassan. Take it away, Dr. Hassan. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Um, as Robin mentioned, my name is Nazia Hassan, and I'm an interventional gastroenterologist here at North Bay. Um, and I'm going to be talking about something really important, reflux, heartburn, and the complications of which can become Barrett's esophagus. Before we go into that, um, I just wanted to mention that I hope you and your families have remained safe during the pandemic. Um, we're almost at the home stretch here. And we are so fortunate in the U.S. to be eligible, all of us are eligible for a vaccine over the age of 16. So I hope you've taken this opportunity to use all your access points, including North Bay, to get vaccinated so we can all end the pandemic. Um, moving on, so I, I, I thought it would be helpful to start talking about um, reflux and heartburn in very basic terms before we go on to Barrett's. Um, and to understand reflux, uh, it's, it's useful to sort of see what's going on at the anatomical level. Um, so I have a, a diagram here of what's happening. So we have the mouth of pier, which goes into the tubular esophagus, a tubular organ that goes into the stomach. And all of the focus of reflux and the problems with reflux is really happening down here at the bottom of the esophagus where it meets the stomach. Um, there's a ring of muscle there called the sphincter, the lower esophageal sphincter. And what happens with reflux is the normal function of that sphincter is to close after we swallow food so that the food can go into your stomach, get digested, and then go move on to the, to the small intestine. But what happens is that the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't tighten, it remains relaxed um, for multiple um, causes of that where food can then come up into your esophagus and cause heartburn and reflux. What does that feel like? Um, most people are very aware. Most people have had some level of symptoms of heartburn or reflux in their lifetime. The typical symptoms include burning in the chest, chest pain below, uh, behind your sternum, right in the middle. Um, it can include hiccups, belching, even atypical refl uh, reflux symptoms like a chronic cough that just won't go away, or voice hoarseness, um, or chronic hiccups like I mentioned. Um, so, and, and what causes this? What are the sort of things that lead to reflux or heartburn uh, to present itself? So the three main kind of sets of causes, there's your diet, there's your lifestyle, and then there's anatomy uh, involved. Diet-wise, there are certain foods um, that cause this muscle, this ring, to relax and not tighten, uh, and also lifestyle things that can, that can promote that relaxing uh, to happen. So those foods are most commonly um, acidic foods, so tomato-based products, grapefruit, citrus foods, caffeine, chocolate, um, alcohol, carbonated beverages. All the good things in life, basically, <laughs> are what cause reflux. Um, and, and when you're t ingesting those foods, it's more difficult for it to tighten and keep the food going down, so it tends to want to come up. Lifestyle-wise, um, there are a few things, that habits that we, may, that we may be doing that promote reflux, uh, and that's overeating, so having a very, very large portions of meals, as well as wearing very tight clothing uh, while we're at, at mealtime, um, and then eating very late at night and going to bed and reclining right afterwards. That all can make reflux much worse as well. Um, and then the last thing is anatomy. So a lot of people who have reflux and heartburn will also have what's called a hiatal hernia. And on this image here, we can see what's happening. So normally, the diaphragm, a muscle that goes underneath the lungs, has an opening that allows the esophagus to go into the stomach. What happens in people who have hiatal hernias is there's a weakening of that opening, and it gets larger. So abdominal fat can do that, just age can do that as well. And that, por that um, weakening in the muscle allows a portion of the stomach to sort of come up into the chest. So you can imagine that makes it more likely that things are gonna reflux up uh, and cause heartburn symptoms. Um, I, I forgot to mention the other thing is this term GERD gets thrown around. So we call it gastroesophageal reflux disease when we actually have symptoms because of the reflux happening. Sometimes we have reflux and we have no symptoms, and there might be no evidence of any disease at the bottom of the esophagus. Um, and so those would just be reflux symptoms as opposed to uh, the actual disease that's happening. Um, how, do we, how do we treat this? So 
you know, I think the the easiest and hardest thing is to act on those diet and lifestyle changes. So avoid those trigger foods that you know are going to be troublesome for you. And sometimes that can be enough to control the reflux symptoms and there, nothing more needs to be done. Um, and then si similar with the lifestyle things as well, not overeating, either eating smaller portions of meals, um, eating earlier on in the night, allowing plenty of time between your uh, dinner time and bedtime will allow food to get digested and go down without having reflux as well. Um, and then uh, there's medications. So, you know, we, I, I think most people are very familiar with the over-the-counter medications, the typical antacids that we use, like Tums. Um, there's also uh, medication classes called H2 blockers and uh, proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs. They're all very effective. You can get them at non-prescription doses or prescription doses as well. Um, so there's lots of options. Um, and then beyond medications, there's also procedures and surgical maneuvers that can help reflux disease if you're tired of taking medications or the medications are just not working. Um, so this is, it's beyond the scope of this talk to really go into those, but I'll just mention a few so that you've heard of them. So there's endoscopic procedures called Streta and TIF, which are uh, trans um, oral incisionless fundoplication focused really at tightening that sphincter. And there's also surgical fund application where it repairs the hiatal hernia and that can also help reflux symptoms quite a bit. Now, what if, what if reflux is untreated? Right, so what if you've kind of been ignoring the symptoms for, for a long time and you feel like you can deal with them and there's actually inflammation happening because of long-standing reflux disease going on? What can happen at that point is you can have so much inflammation that you can have ulceration of the esophagus as well as narrowing of the esophagus called a stricture. Um, and that may present with not being able to swallow food down, feeling like, feeling like food is getting stuck in your chest. Um, and then the one that we're talking about mostly here today is called Barrett's esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus happens from long-standing untreated reflux where that inflammation actually promotes the lining change of the esophagus to look more like the colon lining. And this all can happen very silently. We may never know except some heartburn symptoms uh, for a period of time. We may never know when the Barrett's actually develops. And the reason we care about Barrett's is that it is an underlying condition that can lead to esophageal cancer. Now, um, most people with reflux will not develop Barrett's, and most people with Barrett's um, sort of stay dormant, do not develop esophageal cancer, but the majority of esophageal cancer patients will have had Barrett's previously that could have been identified, diagnosed, and potentially treated. And that's why it's really important to, to discuss Barrett's. Um, the other interesting thing about Barrett's is that the lining changes. So the normal esophageal lining is very, very sensitive, which is why heartburn can be very, very painful. Once that lining changes to look more like the colon lining, interestingly, your reflux symptoms, symptoms may actually improve. You might actually feel sort of better, but that's because Barrett's has developed and that lining isn't as sensitive as it was once before. Um, so what are the things that sort of make, should make you alarmed to, to, to think this is beyond just sort of regular heartburn symptoms that I should take care of when, and once you just see your, doc see your doctor. Um, and that really depends on the length of time you've had reflux symptoms, how well it responds to things like diet and lifestyle changes, um, how severe your symptoms are, um, and then if you have any of the risk factors for Barrett's. So although Barrett's can happen with anybody with chronic reflux um, disease, it happens mostly in men who are Caucasian over the age of 50, if you've had any smoking history or current smoking, and if your waist circumference is over 40 inches. So any one of those, uh, and if you have a family history of, of Barrett's and esophageal cancer, of course. Any one of those risk factors, in addition to chronic reflux, should prompt some sort of an evaluation with the, with the physician, if not a gastroenterologist. Um, and what, you, what you'd expect is when you come to our office, uh, in the GI office, to talk about reflux disease is really pinpointing the triggers and where you are in terms of severity and how we can respond with the treatment. Um, Depending on your risk factors, we'll decide if an upper endoscopy procedure is, is an appropriate thing to do. And during that procedure, we take a small tube, we give you medications to go to sleep, 
We take a small tube with a camera at the end of it, goes inside your mouth into your esophagus as well as your stomach, and we take a look at this at the bottom uh, of the esophagus to see if Barrett's has developed. So our, our, we have a real focus and we can use different light techniques with our camera to really be able to identify if the lining of the bottom of the esophagus has changed to Barrett's. And if it looks like it has, then we're able to biopsy and sample that tissue and confirm if this is Barrett's or not. The other important thing to note is that Barrett's becomes esophageal cancer over a long period of time and it progresses through different steps. So we're able to identify when you have Barrett's with nothing else concerning and we're able to identify all the way to almost uh, Barrett's with almost cancer. Um, and the way that, ha that happens is this term called dysplasia. Where that lining, the cells start to turn abnormal very, very slowly over time. And when we catch you at those points, there are very, very effective treatments we can apply directly to the Barrett's to get rid of it completely. And North Bay um, uh, uh, Medical Center is actually one of the very few centers in Northern California where we have the technology and the expertise to apply this therapy, which is called radiofrequency ablation. Um, and what that involves is doing an endoscopy, as I mentioned, with a camera. We take that camera down into the area of the Barrett's and we use a balloon or a catheter to apply thermal heat energy um, that kind of sloughs off that, that superficial layer of Barrett's. And multiple treatments can get rid of it completely and, and um, extremely uh, reduce your uh, cancer risk uh, extremely low down to almost nothing. Um, so I'll stop talking there because I'd love to hear your questions and, uh, and see what kind of interaction we can have together. And just as a reminder to those who are watching, if you have a question, you type it into the comment just like you would on any Facebook post. We'll be able to see it and pass it along to Dr. Hassan. There is one question that came in beforehand from someone who is wondering about um, NSAIDs and does that make you more likely, taking those pills, does that make you more likely to develop something like this or does it, can it exacerbate it if you already have it? Yeah, and that's a great question because NSAIDs, um, which are um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, the most common ones are like ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, aspirin. They're very common. We use them very commonly for pain uh, control as well as for heart disease. Um, so they're widely used. Now, the problem with NSAIDs is that it can be very erosive mostly to the stomach. It can be very irritating as a direct irritant to the stomach. So when we take NSAIDs, particularly on an empty stomach or in large doses, it can just sit there and it can sort of bore a, an ulcer and develop an ulcer in the stomach. It's less of a concern usually with heartburn or reflux or Barrett's um, itself, but you know it, the entire GI tract is not a fan of NSAIDs. So um, if you have heartburn reflux symptoms and you need to take NSAIDs for some, uh, for some other reason, um, we usually recommend you protect your stomach by taking an antacid, uh, like a proton pump inhibitor medication to, to prevent that from happening. Okay, Lisa is asking if I take I don't know if I'm going to say this right, mm -hmm. omeprazole? Omeprazole. Okay. <laughs> Daily, and it controls the heartburn. Would that indicate the likelihood that I'm not at risk for this? That's right, exactly. So um, uh, I don't know your, um, at least I don't know your ethnicity uh, or background but uh, or your age, but just given the fact that you're female um, and that your heartburn is responding very well to that proton pump inhibitor, the, uh, the omeprazole, and um, sort of means that your risk, overall risk is very low. But if you've had heartburn symptoms for more than five years and you feel like that you absolutely need the medications, meaning you cannot get off of them, it may be worth an index endoscopy with a camera to take a look to make sure that there's nothing else going on. The reason why that's helpful is that we can also identify the presence of that hiatal hernia during an endoscopy. And it can also give us some information about whether you need to be on medications or not, or maybe if diet and lifestyle may be enough for you. And the way we would figure that out is if we do an endoscopy and your endoscopy looks great, the lining is completely normal and healthy, um, then we could argue you can really just take it as you need it as opposed to you have inflammation that we're really trying to treat aggressively. Linda says, how can I get my doctor to take my concerns about this seriously? 
So if you have concerns about this, how do you suggest somebody talk to their doctor about this? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, you know, I think there there's a lot of there can be a lot of misinformation about heartburn and reflux because it is so common. But if you have severe symptoms, um, I, I would really advise you to bring it up as a priority item uh, when you talk to your primary care physician um, and say this is really you know affecting your life and um, you really want some other options, whether it be treatment options or if you want more information about the diagnosis or just talking to a gastroenterologist about the disease process itself, um, just ask for a referral to one of our gastroenterologists and we'll be happy to help. Lisa says thank you for the answer, by the way. Um, how common is Barrett's esophagus? Yeah, that's a great question as well. So most people, as I mentioned, with reflux disease will not develop Barrett's. Of all the people who have reflux or heartburn, about 5 to 10 percent of people will develop Barrett's. Um, and even fewer, 1 percent of those with Barrett's will ever develop esophageal cancer. So um, it's, not a very, very, it's not a very common thing, uh, but because of um, the way we can prevent esophageal cancer, it's so crucial that we distinguish people who are at high risk versus low risk for Barrett's uh, and development of esophageal cancer based on the risk factors we talked about. So how do you know it's not just something you ate, like you like really like spicy food? How do you know when to go and see a doctor with the concerns about this? Yeah, that's a great question uh, as well. As I mentioned, it's, you know, um, most of us had, have had some level of symptoms over our lifetimes and so um, it, I would say the concern becomes when symptoms are persisting and they're severe, they're not being, um, they're not improving with over-the-counter medications. Now if you have spicy food and you have some reflux and heartburn, it goes away and you avoid spicy foods and you don't have the problem, I don't necessarily think you need a, a gastroenterology consult for that, but it's the recurrence and you know how, how often and how severe your symptoms are that will guide you. Okay. We talked earlier about that medication that I can't pronounce. <laughs> Omeprazole? Yes. <laughs> um, what if you found that you now need to take it both in the AM and the PM and you still wake up with heartburn? Is this an indication that you may need to do some investigation? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm assuming this is in the context of never having had an endoscopy done. I, I think um, it's a great question, and I, I think the more information that we can gather at the onset of reflux, reflux symptoms that need medications on a daily basis or for a chronic period of time over five years, I think it's very helpful to get that index endoscopy I mentioned, just to get the information of what the health of the esophagus looks like. If it's completely healthy and devoid of any uh, active inflammation, then we can ease off on the medications and really just go based on symptoms. But if we're dealing with an ulcer or a stricture or Barrett's, that makes it a, a different story in terms of the indication and the necessity for those medications long term. Can you explain what surveillance endoscopy or en endoscopy, endoscopy is and, and how it's performed and how often? Sure. So, um, so if, let's say, you have an endoscopy and you're told that you have Barrett's, um, the question that you should ask is, does this Barrett's, is this non-dysplastic Barrett's or is this dysplastic Barrett's? Meaning, dysplasia is the very early changes in those, in those cells before they become cancer cells. So when we see dysplasia, we get worried. And that dysplasia can be low grade or high grade. So anytime you see dysplasia, that's when that radiofrequency ablation treatment comes into play. It's not used just if you have Barrett's without dysplasia because we don't think the risks and benefits work out in that manner because most patients with Barrett's will never develop dysplasia. But if you have dysplasia, um, it, it heightens our concern and, and makes you a candidate for treatment than to get rid of it altogether. So in terms of surveillance, it will depend on if you have dysplasia or not and if you're a candidate for treatment or not. But if you have Barrett's without dysplasia, which is the most common, we generally um, recommend a repeat endoscopy in three years and every three years from there on where you take, we take routine biopsies, take a very close examination to make sure the cells aren't changing. Sounds like regular colonoscopy. Only. Exactly. Yep, the mouth exactly. side. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Should someone who has frequent heartburn and takes daily meds for it avoid medications to treat osteoporosis? Oh, that's also a very, very good question. Um, 
And the underlying uh, information in that question is that proton pump inhibitors, uh, and this could be a whole Facebook Live talk <laughs> on its own, this whole topic of proton pump inhibitors, but um, there has been a lot of things in the media in terms of how bad these drugs can be, or how, are they good, are they bad, you know, so um, there is some known evidence uh, over a long standing period of time that proton pump inhibitors can lead to osteopenia and osteoporosis, um, it's particularly in Caucasian women over a 10 year period of use. So bone loss becomes a concern when you're on these medications long term. So we recommend if you have osteoporosis already to try to see if you can be on a different class of medications known as H2 blockers. They're the alternative. And and they don't have any kind of risk for bone loss. And so that's when we really manage the kinds of medications you're on and decide to switch because the risks are not worth the potential benefits of the PPIs. Um, and that's very particularly for bone loss. Now there's been a lot of talk about dementia and C. diff and every, everything, every disease known to man being caused by PPIs. All of that data hasn't borne out very well. It's a very commonly prescribed, very effective and safe medication to use. Um, but in osteoporosis, we need to be extra careful because it does lead to bone loss for women. Okay. Uh, so can you live a long life if you're diagnosed with Barrett's? Absolutely. As I mentioned, only 1% of patients will ever, ever develop esophageal cancer with Barrett. So the majority of patients will get surveillance every three years with their biopsies and will have nothing. Um, it's the, the small portion of patients who are again at high risk for cancer otherwise as well, particularly those um, who smoke tobacco. Um, th those folks are heightened for all kinds of cancer. So those people we get more concerned about, but most people who have a diagnosis of Barrett's, nothing will uh, sort of come come from it um, as long as you're doing your surveillance endoscopy for everyone's peace of mind. You talked about earlier that it's possible if with in intervention that you can cure it or erase it. Uh, uh, is there some point where you get beyond the ability to reverse it? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, there are uh, multiple options of treating Barrett's with dysplasia, which is the, the really high risk category that we wanna attack. It's like having a large colon polyp that you know might turn into cancer. It's very similar to that analogy. Now, if you have Barrett's with dysplasia, <coughs> radiofrequency um, ablation is the main first line therapy that's offered. Um, if people fail that, meaning th it hasn't developed into cancer, but they're just not responding, we have what's called cryoablation. We have the ability to freeze the esophagus and freeze off the cells as salvage therapy. Um, when does it become too late is when it becomes cancer. Um, and, and invades that initial wall. Even early cancer, we're able to treat with endoscopy and removing it if it's very, very early and catch it. But once it goes deeper into that wall, that's when we're talking about cancer treatment, like chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. Okay. So who should be screened? So per, great question. So that's a, that's a great way to summarize sort of all of this is if the, the, the alarm signs should be if you have chronic reflux symptoms over five year period, that's the baseline. Without reflux, nothing else, none of these other risk factors are relevant. But if you have chronic reflux, particularly if you are a male that's Caucasian above the age of 50, if you have a smoking history or are a current smoker, if your waistline is, uh, is above 40 inches, so central obesity, um, as well as a family history of Barrett's or a family history of esophageal cancer, each risk factor kind of heightens your risk higher and higher and higher. So the more risk factors you have, the more likely it is that you should be screened. Okay, so diet to avoid it. Obviously, if you have this problem, you're gonna cut off the spicy foods, but what can we do to try to avoid developing? Yeah, so I think some people are just really lucky and have great anatomy and physiology and can eat and drink whatever they want and eat late and, and never have reflux symptoms and 
Um, we really don't like those people, but most <laughs> commonly, the, the normal the people of us, uh, majority of us, will have symptoms with you know some form of spicy foods. It really comes down to those. Tomato happens to be the most potent, right? It's in pizza, it's in pasta sauce. We don't even think about it's it tacos. existing <laughs> in tacos, <laughs> and so tomato-based uh, products uh, and avoiding those. But I would say if you don't have reflux symptoms, there's no reason to avoid tomatoes as a hard and fast rule, but um, that tends to be w one particular thing as well as alcohol and red wine. Red wine is, ha is very acidic, so it can be very problematic in terms of development of heartburn reflux. All right. Janet is asking, how often should someone with Barrett's have an endoscopy? endoscopy. <laughs> you're getting I'm there, you're getting I'm there. I'm getting there. <laughs> um, so it depends on if you have dysplasia or not. It depends on if you have early signs of dysplasia or those cells changing. But if you don't have any dysplasia and only have Barrett's, three years would be your timeline for surveillance. And every three years, we sort of reassess, we take biopsies, look at those biopsies, see if dysplasia has developed and decide. If, if no, if the answer to, is that, uh, to that is no, then it would be another endoscopy in three years. All right. Well, I think we're reaching the end of our time here. And um, we want to thank you for taking the time out to, to explain all of this to us. If you have questions, there's still a couple minutes here you could type them in, but I think that um, You've done a great job at answering everyone's questions on this topic. We do have another Doc Talk Live planned. Our next Doc Talk Live will be on May 19th at 4 p.m. with urologist uh, Herkenwal Kara, and he's going to be talking about five reasons to see a urologist. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, Dr. Hassan. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Stay safe. <laughs>